When you think about archaeology, what do you think about? Do you think about Indiana Jones going off on an adventure or Laura Croft and Tomb Raider? Certainly these bring up key issues within archaeology in terms of the preservation of the human past and how that human past should be utilized and towards whose ends should that past be utilized. Should it be utilized for the general scientific knowledge that archaeologists search for? Should it be utilized in order to make profit for individuals, looters? Or should it be left in the ground at the wishes of the people who claim ancestry, uh, claim relationship with their ancestors that have gone before? These are some of the issues, critical issues in contemporary archaeology today. When we think about archaeology, we have to look at some, what some of the key terms are in archaeology or some of the key ideas within anthropology. After we do this, we'll look at some of the factors for analyzing artifacts and really note the difference between surveying as well as excavating. And then we'll conclude by a discussion of some of the issues in contemporary archaeology. Archaeology, broadly defined, can be thought about as the past tense of cultural anthropology, centering on the material remains of human adaptations to the environment. Some of the objectives of archaeology include reconstructing the material remains of the human past, second, reconstructing the life ways of people who use these different materials, how they utilize them, and also looking at the cultural processes as well as patterns. This is sometimes referred to as processual ar archaeology, which looks at, again at studying the varieties of cultural processes that led uh, to, to, the, to its uh, development. And the uh, idea here in processual archaeology is to use mathematical and statistical analysis in order to better understand the distribution of artifacts, changes in how these artifacts were utilized, and the distribution of trade activities. Post-processual or interpretive archaeology looks at the idea of human agency, and it really highlights the role of human agency. And the idea of human agency, and we'll be talking about this later in the semester in the context of race as well as gender, it looks at some of the differences within a, a culture. That is, um, culture does not determine behavior. Uh, people act within specific bounds but also have some choice as to how they will act. Uh, Post-processual archaeology and interpretive anthropology look at some of these internal contradictions within a culture and the potential of social activities um, that may have influenced certain symbolic or cognitive aspects in cultural variation. So overall, when we're thinking about archaeology, one of the, the key things to have is, is essential terms. And, and trying to define these terms and be able to understand what these terms mean when reading any sort of archaeological account. So archaeologists generally work with sites. And sites are uh, basically a place a uh, precise place where you have the remains of past human activity. And these remains can take a number of different forms, including artifacts, features, and ecofacts, which all can be situated uh, within a matrix, provenience, and uh, as well as an assemblage. Artifacts are portable remains, uh, objects that have been deliberately and intelligently shaped by human or near-human activity. Uh, some of these remains might include things like uh, post holes, uh, evident ev difference in uh, the soil. Hey, scratch that post holes thing. Some of these artifacts might include things like spear points or other types of points or tools utilized for butchering an animal. Features are non-portable remnants of, from the human past, such as house walls or ditches. These can be indicated in the archaeological record through things like uh, post molds, where you have uh, the color of the soil being different, where a wooden post was uh, formerly inserted in there. Uh, also, you have ecofacts, which are the byproducts of human activity, such as plant residues or, or animal bones. A lot of times you find ecofax in middens, or basically you can think about this, these as prehistoric compost piles or prehistoric garbage dumps, basically where people threw uh, a lot of the things that they uh, weren't using off of a plant or an animal. The matrix is the surrounding materials around the artifacts. So is it clay, gravel, or sand? And this, the 
surrounding matrix could be indicative of any sort of site disturbance overall. A lot of times what you'll see in, that archaeologists do, as you can see on the first slides, you'll notice that in those first slides, on, on the picture, the color picture to the right on the first slide, you see that there are essentially uh, strings lined up in a grid format. These help archaeologists to determine the precise location in three dimensions of the particular find uh, within the matrix, within the surrounding materials. And assemblages overall in archaeology, these are artifacts and features from a particular time and place. So some of the factors when analyzing artifacts, you have to look at the potential interference with sites. That is, uh, hyena bones next to human bones, for example, does not mean that the humans ate the hyenas. Uh, there could be a lot of other reasons why those hyena bones were located in close proximity to human bones. It's also important to keep in mind that key information might be missing from the archaeological record. Wood and plant materials are not always represented in the archaeological record due to decay. Often we have, as the earliest signs of cultural traditions, those things which are not organic materials, which do not uh, biodegrade, do not decay. These include things like stone, bronze, and iron. And these artifacts are, are commonly classified in the European context as the earliest sign of cultural traditions. When we look at natural preservation of artifacts, we think about uh, the ways that archaeologists come to have uh, rich resources in some locations and more difficult access to resources in other locations. And climate plays a real important role in the preservation of artifacts. For example, cold alpine regions provide natural refrigeration of, of human and animal flesh, plant remains, leather, and wood discovery, in other words, and so we have things like the 1991 Iceman discovery. On the other hand, hot, arid temperatures preserve human bodies and other organic materials, uh, remains like plant seeds, baskets, and textiles. Uh, overall, if we think, think about things that cause a quick burial, such as natural disasters like volcanic eruptions uh, at the site that you see here, uh, Pompeii in, in Italy, uh, we also think about mudslides. The Ozette example is a good one in Washington State, which cover the site from future erosion. Also, you have um, peat bogs, uh, log pilings as time capsules, which basically uh, encase organic remains and, and don't allow decomposition to occur. When we think about looking at a site at first, what archaeologists do is they'll survey. And uh, surveying is basically a process that allows for a broad analysis of the landscape, the ecological zones, as well as the overall site distribution. The key factor with surveying and the thing that differentiates it from excavation is, is that, that it's repeatable. You can keep surveying a particular site. Many archaeologists can keep going out and surveying a particular site and it's not going to destroy any of the knowledge or resources to do that. Excavations, on the other hand, will yield a, a tremendous amount of information and knowledge about a particular location within the site itself. Uh, generally, these are, ve are very much smaller. Overall, when archaeologists look to see if they have a site and they engage in surveying, there's a number of different survey methods that they can utilize. The first of these is aerial surveys, and these are used to determine the presence of non-portable uh, material culture, such as architecture, canals, embankments. Uh, this can be utilized through bl black and white photography, infrared photography. Um, and you can also see this in aerial photography through uh, differences in growing patterns in the field uh, of contemporary crops. This might indicate the presence of uh, underlying structures or features within a given site. Another tool that archaeologists can utilize in surveying is geographic information systems. These are databases of satellite information, uh, topography, geography, vegetation, water resources, uh, field boundaries, and site location, uh, which are overlain on top of one another, and they help to create predict predictive models uh, which further assist researchers in uh, finding further sites. There's a heavy emphasis with using GIS on environmental features, which really 
that stress on environmental features diminishes the cultural adaptations um, as characteristics of the site. Some of the other survey methods are underground surveys where you use echo sounding or electric resistivity of the soil uh, for magnetic detection of iron or clay. Also the ground penetrating radar which is essentially um, it, it looks very similar to a lawnmower but essentially you push it over the surface and it goes through the waves that it sends out go through materials at different rates and from this these different rates you can have these uh, 3D maps created of the bar uh, buried archaeological remains. This avoids the destructiveness of excavation, uh, particularly in the case of burial, uh, which may often may be restricted in terms of access to archaeologists. We'll talk more about that in just uh, a couple minutes. In terms of excavations, again, it's important that archaeologists work and excavate only a small portion of the site at a given time. And what many archaeologists will say about this is that the technology is constantly improving within archaeology and the methods are getting better as well. Hence, if you wait, you can still, you can have future archaeologists look at the site with greater uh, tools and precision than what, what archaeologists can do in the present. Excavations are essentially the process of removing soil and other deposits to uncover archaeological remains. Essentially, uh, the 3D grid network is put in place to keep track of the different remains that are found, and it's, they, these are recorded uh, by the stratigraphic associations. And there are two types of information when you excavate. You can have the, all of the contemporary or modern activities by space. In other words, if you're excavating horizontally, or if you decide to excavate vertically as an archaeologist, you can look at change over time. Um, also, it's key to note, to really note for archaeologists, to look at the degree of disturbance in order to assess that when making any sort of judgments about a site. Um, so entire occupation level only is excavated in shallow sites. Uh, excavating a multi-layered site is disruptive as well as expensive. And you, what archaeologists will do will be used to use statistics sampling techniques uh, to more precisely choose the sites that they wish to excavate. The excavation process is basically recording the archaeological finds be, uh, by way of photo, writing, um, and, and using sifting techniques in order to extract the artifacts. They'll also use flotation tanks in order to float the organic material, get the light plant material out of there, and recover that. Everything is labeled and bagged uh, for future stores, and I mean everything. I worked on a site in western Pennsylvania, and it was also the site of where some guys, maybe some gals too, hung out and drank beer, and threw the beer into the fire, and it was basically right on top of the archaeological site, which we had covered up for the season. And uh, in the documentation process, one of the things that we had to do, uh, at least in that setting, was to document all of the historic glass. So basically all the beer bottles that people were, were breaking in, the, in their fire pits. Uh, Post-excavation, -exca uh, there's cleaning and classifying different typologies as well as analyzing. And often this process takes uh, longer than the actual time in the field itself. Analysis is done to look for patterns of distribution in space and time. And the excavation record is a key element in this part of the process. So you can see that the, the artifact itself or the remains itself uh, also are important in the context in which they're found. A brief example from Stonehenge, there's an, a link to an article featured. Uh, and and uh, this is from Darville and Wainwright's work in March 2008. Uh, they were permitted uh, for two weeks to conduct the first excavation at Stonehenge in 44 years. Uh, and the reason that it was the first excavation in 44 years is because historically uh, archaeologists and others had treated the site pretty poorly, uh, pretty badly, and the information wasn't recorded in a proper manner. So in order to survey the site, they used ground penetrating radar in order to confirm the location of where they wanted to do their excavation based on the overlap with previous excavations that had been conducted. They they essentially dug a trench 8 by 11 feet and 2 by 6 feet deep, uh, 2 to 6 feet deep. And uh, what they used this was a flotation 
tank in order to look at the organic materials for the radiocarbon dating. Uh, again, radiocarbon dating, looking specifically at organic materials. Um, and from this, the sockets for the blue stones, the, the dates uh, were inferred. Uh, so we have 2400 to 2200 BCE or before the Common Era. The previous literature had, had put this at 2600 BC or BCE. Uh, the blue stones, so what are the blue stones was one of the questions that they were thinking about. And they were thinking that these blue stones perhaps represented healing powers um, or a place of healing, but they, they were wondering whether there's still uh, enough evidence to show that um, or not. Finally, I'd like to conclude this lecture with a brief discussion on some of the contemporary issues within archaeology. First, we have to consider the right to cultural property. Who owns this property? Is it in the ground for all, all of human beings to be able to explore in a scientific context? Uh, you could have potential overlapping uses in a given area. For example, tourism can compromise uh, the preservation of historic era, area. Uh, there's also an issue with keeping the artifacts in the country uh, where it was found. This often entails returning museum items or collections gathered by former colonies. There's a large controversy that's been going on for a number of years with the British Museum and their Egyptian collections. If you go to the British Museum today, you'll actually see a number of uh, brochures that you can pick up, which explain why the British Museum will not return uh, any of their uh, Egyptian collections uh, to Egypt. In the United States, we have a, a fairly unique uh, legislation. This is the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, or NAGPRA which was started in 1990. And NAGPRA essentially provides a process for museums and federal agencies to return certain Native American cultural items to lineal descendants, culturally affiliated Indian tribes, and Native Hawaiian organizations. Rec uh, we also see uh, recent initiatives on the part of Aboriginal Australians for the repatriation of ancestral remains from state institutions. Other threats to archaeological knowledge overall is land development. Uh, we have uh, land development as well as mechanized agriculture can turn up the soil. And you, you can have, a, you can find evidence of a feature or an artifact. In fact, if you go to many farmers, uh, they'll be able to show you a number of points that they've pulled out of their fields uh, in the US, particularly in Pennsylvania and West Virginia from my own experience. Uh, but this doesn't really yield any information about the particular site in terms of the history and the utilization just because uh, it hasn't been located or studied scientifically. Also the idea of selling stolen artifacts in the black market. Uh, looting has greatly diminished future scientific studies of many sites. And legislation that makes allowances for cultural resources uh, that may be affected in the course of local or federal land development uh, at a minimum, um, federal land development or local land development uh, projects are required to assess any environmental impacts of their work uh, on, on planned sites. And uh, one of the things that enters in here is cultural resource management and CRM firms. Uh, this is essentially to meet environmental impact assessments and uh, the requirements under federal law. The CRM specialize uh, in protecting and or salvaging cultural resources. And this started as a concern for conservation, but has evolved into a, a base for archaeological research. Uh, there's a lot of archaeologists as well that are employed in CRM firms today. CRM work is typically compliance driven, which means that uh, the real focus here is on meeting the letter of the law in the quickest and cheapest way possible. Uh, in some instances, firms will take shortcuts uh, with the information, uh, not necessarily revealing the information, uh, just doing the bare minimum in, in order to require, uh, in order to meet uh, the requirements of the law. Uh, one of the firms that's really stood out in a lot of this is Statistical Research Institute, and this is based in Tucson. They're really known for their high quality work, and they're called in after other cultural resource management firms. Uh, have gotten different groups, different stakeholders upset, whether these be Native American groups or anti-development groups, because of the, the poor work that they've done. So in conclusion, uh, we've talked about some of the key terms 
that are important to know in archaeology. Some of the factors that archaeologists must consider in analyzing artifacts as well as the preservation of different archaeological materials. The key differences and some of the techniques of surveying and excavating and some of the contemporary issues which concern archaeologists today.